three, and you get in the okay. book, it talks about the priority intervention. Good look right here. So yeah, elimination. That is something that we worry about because elimination is that, that concept. It means we need to get rid of stuff from our body. If the main concept is eliminating crap from our body, our focus is going to be how all that stuff in the body impacts the body, right? Mm -hmm. So the elimination concept, if you really start getting into it, why do we even talk about acid, acid base imbalances? Why do we care about fluid and electrolytes, immunity, perfusion? Because when you can't eliminate all of this stuff, when I can't get rid of hydrogen ion, ions, when I can't produce enough bicarb, I start having acid base imbalances. I start having fluid and electrolyte imbalances. What do the kidneys get rid of? What do the kidneys regulate really well? What is one electrolyte that we always associate with it? Sodium? Um, somewhat, but when I think about kidneys, I think about something else. I do think about sodium and water. Don't get me wrong. Potassium? I think about potassium. Why do you think I think about potassium more than anything else, though? Yeah, thanks a heart. Yeah, it'll kill you dead. Like, you can die quickly. And if you haven't noticed in nursing... We really worry about what's going to kill the patient the fastest and everything else will just defer to somebody else. That's what prioritization is. That's what delegation is. That's what management of care is. Who ain't going to die today? That's what we need to see first. Like, don't let them die. And I say it that way, not even jokingly. When you're in a hospital with your six patients, who do you see first? The one that's going to die the fastest if you don't do something. So as we're looking here, elimination is going to focus on fluids. It's going to, it's going to focus on electrolytes. It's going to focus on a buildup of of uh, urea and nitrogen and all these byproducts and how it's going to impact the body. And that's what I was trying to get you to. When you look at acute kidney injury, go back here and look at this. Look at the creatinine levels. Look at the glomerular filtration rate. A uh, rate. Make sure you understand how you know the kidneys are working or not working. And that will always be by somebody else uh, doing some lab work or something. Like We don't have to guess if they're working or not. We can just do lab work and it'll tell us if they're working. That's what the doctors do. So you and I don't have to worry about that. All right, so here's what I was getting at. On this page here, on, on page 1377 in your book, the 10th edition on table 63.4, it lists these types of contributing factors that really cause acute injuries to your kidneys. So you've heard of these before, right? You've heard of perfusion reduction or a, a, a pre-renal. Mm -hmm. Did your teacher talk about that in class yet? Yes. She did. Yes. Okay, so pre-renal versus intrinsic renal versus post-renal. Why does it matter? It matters because you have to know that certain other comorbidities are important for you as a nurse. So when it says your patient has hypertension or your patient had a heart attack or your patient has heart failure, in your mind, you have to think if you have these comorbidities, it is far more likely that you suffer from acute kidney injury as well, Right. That's what our job is as a nurse. Our job is a nurse. Why do people go to the hospital? Let me ask you that question. Have you ever thought about that? Why do doctors admit patients into the hospital? What is your best guess? Because they're kind of sick. Care? They are sick. But does your doctor take care of you in the hospital every time you're sick? Or do they give no. you a home? What is at the hospital that's not at your house, typically? Um. IV fluid, um, drip. The, the nurse? The, the nurse. <laughs> Y'all, the, the hospital exists so you and I can be there with patients and not let them die. Because if the doctor thought they could do it at home, the doctor would give them antibiotics and send them home. Nursing care happens in the hospital. Home health. We have, so that's my whole point, is that you're... You have to understand this stuff too. The doctor knows what causes kidney failure, but if you're not looking at your patient, if you don't make the, 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 the correspondence that, ah, oh, my patient has a high fever, my patient has a, a low blood pressure, my patient has a known source of infection, shoot, they might have what's called septic shock. That really leads you to kidney failure. So I need to be on the lookout for kidney failure. My job in the hospital is not to know everything. My job in the hospital is to look at my six patients, look at their history, their comorbidities, the medications they use at home, and try to figure out, do any of these things impact kidney function? And if they do, I have to be aware of that. Your test is going to make you aware of that. They're going to want to know, what is a pre-renal cause of kidney failure? And if you don't know, you're going to be like, uh-uh. So pre-renal pre means everything that includes blood flow into the kidney, right? Here's the kidney, pre is before. Well, we agree with that. If I have a heart attack, my heart no longer works. It decreases my cardiac output. 
right? Because cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. I'm doing a whole nother lecture next week on just cardiac. So <laughs> just like this. So when you think about that, if you have a heart attack, you're no longer getting what? Good cardiac output. If you don't get good cardiac output, you're not perfusing your what? Your kidney. If you have blood loss and you are hypovolemic, do you have enough volume to support your kidneys? The answer is no. If you are, have blood pressure medications and they're, too, they're working too well and your blood pressure is too low and you're not perfusing your kidneys, or if your blood pressure is too high and it's causing pressure that can't get into the kidneys, y'all, they're all the same thing. Anything that occludes blood from going into the kidney is what causes the kidney to die because it's not being perfused anymore. That's it. So that's why we talk about all of these things over here that can screw you up, even severe burns, all of that. You can see it's important. I put over here, students must know the causes of each. Pre-renal refers to anything that prevents blood flow. I mean that because I've taught this class before. I know I've had the test before in my hands. I'm not going to give you the answers, but I can tell you the kind of stuff that we need you to know. These are the bigger concepts between 242 and 265. All right, so what would be intrinsic? What would be an intrinsic or an internal renal cause? What, what does that mean to you? If I say your kidney's broken. Something like damaged. Yeah, damaged. Yeah, damaged. Yeah. Yeah, it could be anything, glomerular nephritis, where you have inflammatory response in the glomerulars. It could be that you have a local infection, so pyelonephritis, right? A, a kidney injury, you could have got a laceration, you could have got stabbed, you could have got shot, you could have got a, a, a whatever, I don't know, right? You could have cholesterol that built up and it blocked the blood flow inside the kidney, so it's no longer pre-renal, you blocked your kidneys all up. It could be a blood clot in, in the veins or the arteries, whatever. But you're saying there's an actual problem with the kidney. You have a kidney injury. Pre-renal, you're not getting blood flow. Intra-renal or intrinsic, it's intrinsic to the actual kidney itself. The kidney does not work. Uh, Post-renal is anything that includes blood flow outside of it. So bladder cancer, colon cancer, cervical cancer. This is how I think about these. I think about like hypertension and heart attack is pre. I think about a damaged kidney is intra. And I think about cancer is after. I'm not that bright, y'all. I just stick with the things I know. <laughs> if, you can, if you can memorize that. You'll probably be fine. Does that make sense, though, understanding yes. why it's important to know these now? It does. Yeah. Good, good. Because when you start looking at test questions, they're going to they're gonna make it very vague. And they'll, they'll put things in here like this. And you're like, oh, I remember if you have sepsis, you might have kidney injury. Great. Move on. Good to go. <laughs> All right. Here's another thing I want to get into is drugs. What drugs are nephrotoxic? The mycins. Mycins, yeah. yeah. My, there's so many of them. Look on my left. Look over here what I got on my book. I highlighted antibiotics because antibiotics are always a problem when you have kidney failure. All the myosins are always a problem when you have kidney failure. And your incense are always a problem when you have kidney failure. So I don't even pretend to know all of them. I don't. As a nurse on the floor, I am way better at this than a, than a nurse who is teaching college because I'm not there all the time. Right? So I, I think about these things. I didn't mean to go so far up. Y'all apologize. But I, I do want you to go back and think about some of the drugs. You got it right. If you look at your myosins, if you look at your antibiotics, if you look at some of your insets, those are really the things that are going to impact your patient. Why does that matter? Because you are the nurse. When I ask you why it matters, and when you read your book, I hope you look at your book and I hope you think of yourself sitting at Methodist Hospital or whatever hospital you're around and think about having six patients and just stand there and look at them and think, what am I going to do with these six patients? who all are acutely ill and injured, it's overwhelming. I need, to, I need to know everything. I need to look at my patients and say, oh, you have kidney failure or you have acute kidney injury. When I go in there with my MAR to give medications, my job as a nurse is to A, make sure I do no harm. And if I'm giving you medications that are nephrotoxic and make your kidney failure worse, am I doing my job? The answer is no. That's why we keep testing you on what seems like some of the stupidest stuff but it's not stupid. You're going to kill your patient if you give them some of these over here. Makes sense, right? Yes. All right. And then I go down here a little bit more and I say nurses have an essential role in preventing AKI a lot because we're always on the lookout through the assessment, looking for dysfunction of the kidney, looking at lab values, doing that early recognition. Are they not eliminating? Are they not peeing out at least 30 mLs an hour for the last two hours? Or is their urine so concentrated and dark that it looks like orange amber urine? That's where you come into play. The doctor is not there. Guess what the doctor doesn't need? The doctor doesn't need you as a nurse to tell them how to do their job. 
Like it or not, the doctor went to school for 12 years. They don't need our input in, on how to do their job. What they need is our input on what their patient is experiencing. You are literally the eyes, the ears, you're everything the doctor can't be because the doctor is at another hospital or the physician. Let's say that the physician is taking care of the other 16 patients, 68 patients, 150 patients, whatever. So as my patient's laying in bed, I need to always be looking. I can't just be doing stupid stuff. I'm not on the phone. I'm not trying to play with my friends. I'm looking at somebody's mother, father, loved one, their child who has kidney failure. And I'm trying to figure out what's going on with them. Because if I don't pay the attention to this, if the urine starts to get heavier sediments, if it's starting to get smokier or red in color, if it becomes more foul, if there are worrisome changes that I don't see and I don't report, I can kill my patient, y'all. Look at this last line right here where my, my, I'm scrolling. It says, waiting for six hours of oliguria to meet the AKI criteria may allow progression to kidney damage. Because your book says you're supposed to wait six hours of oliguria. What's oliguria mean? That word. Um, less urine. No urine production. Yeah, so it's not, it's not an urea, right? So we're not not peeing, but it's less than 30 mLs an hour for two hours. The book says you need six hours of oligaria to meet the AKI criteria. Y'all never wait six hours for your patient not to pee. You know what I mean? Like, So what is a nursing priority? I ask you these because nursing questions love to say the nursing priority is what? What is my nursing priority in a patient who is not peeing? Get them to pee. Yeah. So we have to prevent things. We have to think about the depletion of urine. We have to get out of urine. How do you get rid of urine in somebody who can't get rid of it? What, how do we get rid of byproducts and people who can't get rid of byproducts? How do we get rid of waste? What do y'all know? Is there a foley? Would you put in a foley? You could put in a foley, but the kidneys aren't working. Is that going to do anything for the kid? Is there any urine to take out if the kidneys aren't making urine? Mm -hmm. These are the problems. So how do we do it? And that's where we're going to get into some of the different types of uh, hemodialysis and peritoneal analysis. This is, I, I, man, the concepts don't really change that much. I'm just trying to get you more ready to be a nurse. 265 is going to ask a lot of the same type of questions as 242. It doesn't get too much crazier. But now it just comes faster and stronger, and, and they just expect more from you. And 280 and 283 is going to keep coming in ATI and NCLEX. So this is your opportunity to this term to really start looking at it and say, okay, what do I need to know about this stuff? And get in here and look. Do what like Mr. Streb is doing. If there's a concept you don't understand, if it sounds important, in any acute care setting, preventing volume depletion and providing intervention early will, with volume depletion occurs as a nursing priority. Reduced perfusion from the volume depletion is a common cause of AKI. So we need to make sure they're getting fluids. If you're not peeing, you don't, you have to keep giving them fluids and you have to figure out a way to get it out of them, right? right. All of this stuff. Yeah. So dialysis. You'd, we would do dialysis. That's correct. I'm going to get into dialysis in a little while. Why do we do dialysis? Because of this right here. If you get in here and look at all of this, we do dialysis because you're not filtering the blood. So when we look at them, go back and look at lab values. Make sure you know your lab values. We're going to talk about creatinine, BUN, and GFR throughout your entire class. Will it be on every one of your test questions? Will it even talk about any of that? I don't know. I don't have your current exam, nor do I want to see your current exam because that scares the hell out of me. I don't ever want to say anything wrong, right? I don't need your exam either because I know what every book is going to talk about because NCLEX wants to know, are you able to identify a priority patient? Are you able to delegate that to the right level? And are you able to manage their care? If you can do that, we win. So I know what the book is going to ask me to do. When the kidneys aren't working correctly, there is going to be a significant increase in creatinine. There is going to be a significant increase in BUN. It doesn't take long. You can start seeing kidney failure pretty rapidly because it can, it can progress into death even quicker if we have a real problem. So look at some of the other lab values, your serum blood uh, nitrogen, your serum potassium levels. You were right, Linda, your sodium is important. So is your osmolarity and your urine-specific gravity, your albumin, all of these things matter. Do you have to know them 100%? No, but understanding if they go up or down is important. Understanding that BUN will increase because if you're not peeing out urine and nitrogen, it has to go up. Understand that the creatinine is a big breakdown of skeletal muscle, right? And if my creatinine levels go up and I can't pee them out, it's because my kidneys aren't working. So you're going to see those type of things that show up on a test. Don't be surprised by them. Don't let them scare you. Don't let them confuse you. Um, so 
that's part of it. A big thing here is also think about medications. When you're looking on exams and, and, and you're looking at NCLEX and ATI, look at the medications, especially when they're talking about somebody with a kidney problem. I assure you medications are super important every time they talk about kidney problems. That makes sense, correct? We're trying to make sure you understand that. What, what kills your kidneys? A lot of stuff, typically blood pressure nowadays, it, it, literally we kill ourselves because we don't maintain good diets, weight and exercise and that kind of thing. It's sad. But combining two or more nephrotoxic drugs increases your risk for acute kidney injury drastically. That's why it's important. What do we know about drugs, kidney injuries? What do you remember about this? If you're going to get an MRI and you have acute kidney injury, what do I need to know about it as a nurse? You're like, oh, Mr. Streb, I don't remember. <laughs> do y'all remember anything? Go Wait, that's not where you need the contrast, right? MRI, uh, CAT scan, yeah, you can go and you'll, you'll get a, you'll get an imaging with contrast. If you go back up here and look at these things, contrast. So also that, they're going to use dye, so dye affects the kidney. Yeah, look right here, radiographic contrast media. That's what they use. So. What else? Go, go over here on this other side of this list over here. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, metformin. Metformin. What is this right here? Radiographic contrast dye. What's it say right here in your book? It says combining two or more nephrotropic drugs drastically increase your risk for ATK, AKI. If my patient is already on metformin, who's on metformin? What kind of patients are on metformin? Diabetic patients. Who's got diabetes in San Antonio, Louisville, everybody. Not really, it's kind of a, it's a blanket statement, but so many people are on metformin. When you come in to get an MRI, what is your job as a nurse? Go down a little more. This is what I'm trying to get you to understand. We always, this is the test question I see all the time. When a nephrotoxic agent, such as contrast medium, will be used, additional nephrotoxic medications, such as metformin, should be withheld. You're right. I've seen this on every test question I've ever seen, but it's not just metformin. It could be any antibiotic, it could be an NSAID, you're not supposed to combine the two. Once your patient comes back from MRI or CAT scan, what do you tell them to drink? A lot of fluids, right? Ideally, it even says down here, when your patient comes back, you should be administering IV fluids, period, and post-procedure. In the hospital setting, if I send you to get a CAT scan and you have kidney injuries, I promise you we will. We'll give you pre-fluids and we'll give you post-fluids because we need to get that out of your system because it just makes your kidney worse. We're only on page, like the second page of the book right now. I'm not trying to make you memorize everything. I want you to really understand the concept here. I'm not able to get rid of crap. So if I'm taking metformin and I'm taking and I'm taking contrast medium and I'm not peeing, what happens to all of these chemicals that are in my body? They just It'll stay there. Yeah. Y'all, I can take metformin, NSAIDs, and get a, a, an MRI today, not drink any water, and I'm not going to die of kidney failure. My kidneys are good. It's going to be okay. But it puts me at risk. I ain't going to try it. When I get an MRI, I drink the crap out of some water. Yeah, I've been drinking water like three, three or four liters a day for the last 12 years because I got freaked out about dying of bladder cancer because I smoked a lot as a kid. I'm like, screw that. I'm doing do what I can. <laughs> so my point is just this. I'm not trying to get you to remember stuff. Everything we're talking about now is safety. I've been talking about knowing the, the levels so you can see if they're bad or not. Understanding when you mix medications together, it can affect the patient. I'm talking about things that matter. I even took notes of it over here. Look, you can even see my own notes because I, I skip a lot of stuff. Interprofessional care, there's a great a lot of things you're going to do. You're right. You're going to work with all kinds of people. We know their immunity is going to go down. So look at that to identify immunity. Just be aware that people who can't get rid of toxins will naturally be more uh, susceptible to disease. It's going to lower their immune system. You can go back and read about the immunity and how it affects the immune system if you want. I don't need to get into all that because I just know it works. If you can't accept that, understand it. Make sure you low, look at your, your, your lab values. Know your mass. You know, it says evaluate the vital signs to recognize early hypoperfusion and hypoxemia. What does that mean? If my kidneys aren't doing their job correctly, that means... I'm getting hypoperfusion. I'm getting hypoxic. The signs and symptoms of hypo, hypoxia and hypoperfusion look the same regardless. When you have a, a reduced blood volume, your MAP is below 65. Why do we care? That is more of an ICU type question, right? That's what 265 is. 265 is, a, is, a, is an ICU class. 242, 
is a med search class. We're getting more specific. Make sure you understand that. It might say your patient has a map of 65. If you don't know that that's bad, you will never know how to make that answer better. I get it. This is just one, it's just one thing, but it's not so much that the map, if you understand a map is the mean arterial pressure, meaning how much fluid I have and how much perfusion I have, you get to know that when the map starts to grow lower and lower and lower, I'm not perfusing correctly. That's all you need to know. Those are things that nurse, you ever hear that song? I know a few things a man ought to know. I don't know if you listen to country music, but there's a song. I'm gonna make a song. I know a few things a nurse ought to know. These are things you as a nurse just ought to know. You need to know that urine may be diluted with a specific gravity near one or concentrated with a specific gravity near 1.030. There's gonna be the presence of things, RBCs, cast. Why? Because your kidneys get rid of RBCs. Your kidneys get rid of this stuff. If you can't pee it out, you're gonna have myoglobin. You're gonna have hemoglobins um, that build up and it's gonna to lead to kidney damage. It perpetuates the problem. That's why it's important because when you get that lab report back and you're like yesterday, the RBCs weren't in the blood and today they, oh, what does that mean? I don't know. Hey, physician, let me tell you what I got right here going on. What's it mean? Because you're the doctor. You tell me. I don't have to know. My job is a nurse. So go back. Look at these. I'm not going to go over these with you. This for you to know. I already know. You got to know. You got to figure out a way to commit them to memory. I'm lazy. Y'all, CM creatinine to me is one. Eh. Yeah. 0 0.6 for a dude to one, ah, close enough to one. Is that what you say too, Linda? Or Faith, how do y'all do that? Yes, zero point, like 0 0.5 to one, right? Yeah. Somewhere around there. Is I, it 1.2 or one? Yeah. What'd you say, ma'am? I said, is it 1.2 or one? It is zero. You can look here on the book. It, it depends on who you are. Um, so for me, I, I'm not interested in memorizing all this. I just know if it's, if it's greater than one, and I don't mean 1.1, 1.2. That doesn't ever bother me. I told y'all earlier, if it's close enough, it's close enough. If it was 0 0.4, I wouldn't even be that freaked out on a woman. If it was 0 0.5 on a dude, I'm not that scared about it. Um, if it's like 1.6, I'm like, oh, yeah, I definitely know that's wrong. I promise you on test, we're going to make it high enough where you're going to know. In real life, you don't have to memorize it. You're going to pull up a piece of paper, and it's going to say lab values, and it's going to say right there. It's going to, you don't have to worry about it in real life. You can look it up on a test. It's going to be so obvious as long as you know it's close to one, you'll be all right. Okay. That's all I'm trying to say. Whatever works for you, if you have a good memory and you can memorize all this, great. ABGs, once again, I always teach 22 to 26. Does it really matter? 21 to 28? It, it just depends on what we're looking at. Your test is going to have an 18 bicarb or a 30 bicarb. You get what I'm saying? Um, yeah. Here it talks about serum carbon dioxide, 23 to 30. We're saying... Everything's a little bit different. Arterial blood, you know, 35 to 45. Go back and look at them. Hematocrits, hemoglobin, they also start to go down. You know, they are decreased. Why? Why would kidney failure cause your hemoglobin hematocrit to be decreased? We've already talked about it. We start thinking about erythropoietin and we start thinking about how the kidneys do uh, reabsorb what we just talked about right up here. We had to talk about RBCs and myoglobin and the rest of this stuff. It's complicated. So go back. Don't, don't try to memorize this. Just really look at it and be like, what happens in kidney disease? Why do all these go up? Or why do they go down? Or what is it? It just helps you better understand the picture. That's all we're trying to get you to do is understand the picture of what's going on. Interventions. Man, there's a lot you can do. I, I'm not, I don't even get into this so much because I would just be talking about things for no reason. We are trying to avoid, we talk about this, we're trying to avoid the hypotension, meaning they're not getting enough fluid in to perfuse their organs. And we're trying to maintain their normal fluid value, volume balance. That is our role here. Go back to what I said right up here when I, when I put this over here and I said, make sure the students understand what we're trying to do. The priority, where is it? priority is elimination. It, it, it's fluid volume. That's, where, that's what we're trying to get you to, to really think and consider. Okay. Um, Another thing I want you to consider is this. We've already talked about drug therapy. You already know that drugs, if you combine uh, two or more of those drugs or any kind of chemical that is nephrotoxic together, it can cause even more problems. So be on the look for that. But we also know if my kidney is not working, the one electrolyte that really scares me to death is too much potassium because that can cause you to have a what? Heart attack. Okay. Yeah. So... My patient who has AKI often has a, a, a high rate of 
uh, uh, catabolism. It means they break down protein harder when we have uh, uh, catabolism. So I, I, you can say whatever you want. Um, cat catabolism or whatever makes you happy. It causes a breakdown in the muscle protein. It causes an increase in azotemia. And this is what you start seeing on patients. That's why they start having um, a buildup of things. That's why their uremia levels go up. That's why their nitrogen levels go up. We start breaking down these proteins. We start breaking these down. Uh, it can be related to anything. This is the same thing with diabetics. When diabetics get sick and they start breaking down their proteins and they go into DKA, right? Your body does the same thing regardless when you're sick. That happens in AKA as well, or AKI, uh, acute kidney injury. So if I know that my body is breaking down all this stuff and it's holding on to things that are bad for me, what kind of diet? This also includes potassium. So make sure they're placed on a low potassium diet. Make sure they're placed on a low sodium diet and make sure they're placed on a low fluid diet. I'm not saying we can't give them fluids and other stuff, but we can't overwhelm their system. So nutrition, you're in the hospital for 12 hours a day with this patient. You have to feed them, you have to bathe them, you have to do everything with them. So everything that can occur in that 12 hour shift now becomes your responsibility as a nurse. And typically in that 12 hour period, everything that can kill you or make you worse is what I'm gonna focus myself on. So. You don't have to go back and read all of this and get into the into the real depths of it. Just understand that if I can't if I can't excrete potassium, sodium, and fluid, that I have to be on some kind of restriction on every one of those. I don't think we get into any of this where we get all crazy on the actual dietary milli equivalents. That's what nutrition's for. That's not a nurse's job. You know what I mean? So that's what we're gonna do. And there's things they can do. We don't really talk about kidney replacement therapy that I'm gonna get into. Um, I'll let you look at your book there. So that's, that's what I got going on here with, with these bad boys. Um, I do want to get into dialysis, which is on the next one. Y'all still with me? Yes, I'm here. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I know I'm just going through a lot, but you know, it's, it's okay. That was acute kidney injury. There are things that we can do with acute kidney injury. Let me go back one time. The focus on acute kidney injury is the kidneys are still going to work later. So let's don't screw them up. Can we agree on that? Yes. Yes. So make sure you're paying attention to the medications. Make, that's why this part is important. If you're thinking about like this in a blinder, in the tunnel vision, if I'm thinking about acute kidney injury, I'm trying to preserve as much kidney function for future use as possible. That's why the priorities are a little bit different there. When we get into chronic kidney disease, it's already jacked up, y'all. You're not gonna fix it. We are now in how do I keep you from dying? And what can we do to make you live longer? So over here, progressive irreversible disorder lasting longer than three months. Progressive irreversible. There's nothing you can do about it. When the kidney function and waste elimination are too poor to sustain life, that's when you go into end-stage renal. There's different stages. There's four or five stages, right? Yes. Five. Depends on what you want to count. If you look down here, it talks about, you know, terms used. Just look at these for a second. Azotemia. <clears throat> I like putting that word over here. I even have it in my notes here, right? Azotemia is a buildup of the nitrogen in your waste products. B-U-N, right? That kind of, but that's the nitrogen part. Uremia is kind of the same thing. Uremia takes azotemia, uh, 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 azotemia and combines it with um, all the other symptoms that, that kind of come with this. You can look, look in your book here and the, the key features of your Rima box. So when you look up here in these key features, so azo, uh, azotemia is a buildup of nitrogen-based waste in the blood. Uremia is that as well with these signs and symptoms saying that it's gotten worse. So azotemia is typically that first stage of kidney disease. It's like, okay, we're having some problems. It's starting to build up. That's what matters. And then you're like, oh, now we have uremia. It's just even worse. Now, the patient's presenting with anorexia, they're vomiting, they have muscle cramps. Start thinking why again. We'll look at this in a little while when we start thinking about calcium and things like that. Um, <clears throat> fatigue and lethargy and edema. Once you start combining all of these things together, that's what uremia is. So make sure you know the difference. Uremia is just a worse stage of, of, of kidney failure. <clears throat> you kind of kind of go through there. Um, I won't get into all the different stages of kidney failure. I'll, I'll let you do that yourself. But, you know, it, just, it basically boils down to you're not able to produce enough urine. And we talked about that. 
your, your glomerular filtration rate is a big one. Less than 90, we know is what we consider. Look over here in the first stage, less than 90. If you ever have a GFR less than 90, you are definitely in kidney failure. It gets worse as you progress. You get into those late stages, it gets worse and worse. All this here, the levels of your, your, your BUN, your CM creatinine levels, your uric acid, your phosphorus, uh, they're not sensitive enough to define this stage. So when we start looking, we, we just can't always know, just understand that as your kidneys start to go bad, these things start to go up. Your phosphorus goes up. Everything starts to go up. Um, I was talking to you earlier, Faith. What, is the in, what, what does phosphorus cause to go down? Um, calcium. Okay. Yeah. So as your body is no longer able to, to urinate and get rid of all the BUN and, and the creatinine and the phosphorus, now it decreases your calcium levels because they're inversely related. As phosphorus goes up, calcium goes down. If you remember anything about the parathyroid uh, hormone, right? If you cut that out and you don't have potassium, you start getting tetany and all these other things. Muscle cramps. Y'all, if you understand the pathophysiology of the kidney, you don't have to guess why there's muscle cramps. You're like, ah, because you got this stupid phosphorus level so high, your calcium level goes down. And I know that causes... Right. I've been doing this job for a lot of years. I just learned this not too long ago myself because it's still hard, y'all. It's okay. I promise you, it's okay not to know everything. But this is where I want you to start thinking about your patients and how they're going to present. You don't have to memorize everything in the book. So patient, um, teach the patients about chronic injury. Talk about fluid volume. Talk about blood pressure. Talk about electrolytes. You have to make sure they understand you don't get to go eat high potassium rich foods anymore and make sure you have a list of what those look like because any one of them could be presented on NCLEX, right? Make sure that you understand drugs and that they're not taking nephrotoxic drugs together or if they are going to get a CT scan that you stop the metformin for at least 24 hours so you can clear the system and we don't cause more kidney damage. Those type of things. All right. Anything else? I did have a couple more things I want to go. I, I go through things that there's a lot in the book, y'all. You, you've you gone through urine and creatinine. If you, if you have any problems, like, go back and look at it. Go back and read it one time. Don't read it for memorization. Just kind of be like, oh, yeah, that makes sense and move on from it. Like get an idea of what it's talking about. Go back and look at potassium and understand that when we have somebody who has kidney disease, what are we looking at? We know that normal potassium levels are 3.5 to 5, and we know that somebody who is in kidney failure very well might be in the 6 range or even the 7 range or even up to 8 if we're not careful. But that doesn't mean they're going to die right that second, but they will die soon enough. You have to know that. If you send a patient to, a, to dialysis, which of the following lab values would be a good indicator that it was effective, right? And they have a serum potassium level of four. Do you think if their serum potassium level is four that they had a good use of dialysis? They should, they should be. Yes. Yeah. Those are the kinds of signs and symptoms we're looking for. Those are the nursing outcomes. Those are the interventions. That's what we're trying to get you to do. All right, um, down here as well. When we start thinking about how, I talked about the parathyroid gland earlier. Remember I was talking about that and how um, the parathyroid controls the amount of phosphorus in the body. It causes tubular you know, uh, excretion of phosphorus, blah, blah, blah. When you start having CKD, you reduce that phosphorus excretion. And I told you that already, that they're, they're, they're inversely related. As you get that hyper phosphorus levels going up, it decreases your calcium. Okay, we can keep going on that too. What else is affected by calcium? Where does calcium come from? If my phosphorus levels are so high, my calcium levels have to go down. What do you think my body is going to break down to get that, that calcium out of my body? Where, where's calcium stored, y'all? In the bones. In the bones and? Teeth. Teeth. So we know that chronic mm -hmm. kidney disease also causes low uh, calcium levels. It causes increased phosphorus levels. And they call that renal osteodystrophy. Renal osteodystrophy. I've heard this before. Your teacher will talk about renal osteodystrophy. What does that mean? Bone mineral loss. It causes bone pain. It causes uh, 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 sclerosis. It causes fractures. It causes you to be at risk for osteomyelitis and tooth decay and all of this stuff. So that's what I mean. People be like, oh, Mr. Stray, what was that test question where it talked about if you understood what the kidneys do, 
you would not be surprised when you're like, oh, the phosphorus levels are up, the potassium, the, the calcium levels go down. My body's going to deplete my stores through bone breakdown and teeth breakdown. I'm going to have bad teeth and maybe even have osteoarthritis or osteomalacia or anything like that. Crazy, right? That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. What does the kidney do? It filters. But what does it filter out? What is its normal rule? What does it normally do? And when it's broken, what can it normally not do anymore? Because that's going to tell you every sign, symptom, and complaint that your patient's going to have. Does that help on any level? Yes. I sure. hope so. I hope that. Um, that's what this whole big ass slide, excuse my language, y'all said a bad word. That's what this big old slide talks about. <laughs> I don't mean to say bad words. I am recording this. I'm going to post it regardless. So I apologize to anybody watching this. Um, <laughs> But go I'm going to switch to my phone. I want to rush and pick up my son if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. We have about 10 minutes. Do whatever you need to do for sure. Okay. Um, but this is what I'm talking about. You can go back. I can't literally go back and talk about everything here. Um, participants, admit. It's me. Okay, there you go. I got you. <laughs> so make sure I got you back in here. Cool. Um, and then you, you, you can. You can go through here and look at this as well. You can go back and think about cardiac. You know, how does cardiac change? Hypertension alone can damage kidneys. So it's not that it changes so much. We know that that is the result of it. So I'm not getting back into all of that. You, you can start to imagine what it looks like. There's just too much for us to ever go over. You can't possibly memorize everything about CKD. Unless you just got one of those brains where you can read and you're good. That's not your boy ever. <laughs> nope. So go back and look at some of these things, preventing the kidney and urine problems. That is part of your problem. How do we prevent? Because you have to teach your patients. The kidneys want, need one to two liters of fluid every single day. If you don't drink one to two liters of water a day, y'all, that's only one liter is four cups, two liters is eight cups. How, if you two, how many of you are drinking at least eight cups of water every single day? I try. Not me. <laughs> this is 750 mLs. That's three cups. I drink about four of these a day. That's 12 cups of water. That's three liters. I promise you, when I realized what water did and how my kidneys work, and I, what I realized, y'all have 242, that bladder cancer is caused by smoking and things you breathe in, I started realizing the more you drink water, the less time you have for jump to stay in your kidneys. If you don't want to have kidney damage, you should drink three liters of water a day. It should be your priority. Do you lock your doors at night when you go to sleep? Yes. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to get raped and murdered. You will die of kidney disease if you don't drink enough water. I, I'm just saying it out there. Do you wear your seatbelt? You know what I mean? Though, just as equally as important. I say this because your, your, your patients need to have this stress. To, this is not just things we say to say it. We know without a doubt. There's no doubt. There's scientific evidence to show if I'm drinking at least two liters of water a day, my risk for kidney disease is greatly diminished across my entire lifespan. Now I'm going to go get a water. <laughs> you should. I hope you do. I hope you start drinking lots of water because it's important. Go back and look at some of these things again. Make sure you think about diet adjustments. Think about the sodium, the protein, the cholesterol restrictions. Think about weight maintenance. Um, think about achieving that body mass index. These are things that pop up like an NCLEX and they pop up on ATI because they want you to be able to talk to your patient. You already know if somebody's smoking, quit smoking. That leads to uh, arteriosclerosis. What do you think gives blood flow to your kidneys? Tiny, tiny blood vessels. So diabetes is going to screw up your kidneys. Smoking is going to screw up your kidneys. Hypertension, screw up your kidneys. Heart failure, heart attack, all these preventable things. We're like, I really love to eat. I really love food. I'm going to live until I die. You're right. You will live until you die. And every one of us die. You're going to die a lot faster if you lose your kidneys quicker. So make sure you can talk to your patients about diet as well. Um, and, and that's all I'm going to say on this because I, I want, well, no, I need to get down here to, to my, um, dialysis. Ah, there we go. So with dialysis, there are two forms of dialysis. When your kidney no longer works, I'm trying to find where I want to start here. Y'all. So just give me one second. When your kidneys no longer work, we can do dialysis as a temporary, um, whatever until you either die or you get a kidney transplant. There is no other option in kidney failure. You will die from it or you will get a kidney transplant. There's no two options. Um, know that when you go in, you have to go in, they're gonna put you on a dialysis type thing. So you could either do hemodialysis where it pulls your blood out and it, it takes your blood out of your body 
it cleans your blood over here in a machine and it puts back your clean blood into your body. Or you can do peritoneal dialysis where we put the dialysate into your peritoneum, which is your stomach, and we allow your body to just naturally work its way through there, clean out its toxins, and then that, uh, that, that dialysate leaves your body. So it's the same thing. One, your body is the uh, dialysizer. And then the other, you have a dialysizer. Kind of the same, same. What do we care about? Well, it depends on what we're doing. If you're doing hemodialysis, you're going to have to have a shut place, right? Uh, an AV fistula, if you will. They're going to either take your artery and your vein and your arm or somewhere, and they're going to combine those together to make what's called a fistula, or they will attach a man-made artificial fistula, or they may even give you like a sub, like some kind of um, subclavian catheter, like a, a pick line or something. It just really depends on your case as a patient and what your doctor says. But what I know about this is the same thing every single time. Once you're in kidney failure, I can't do anything to fix your kidney failure. But you are gonna to come to my dialysis center where I as a nurse am gonna make sure that you get your dialysis. But before we can do that, we have to know all this stuff right here. So please do yourself a favor and go back and look at this. Make sure you know where not to take a, a blood pressure. Uh, make sure you know how to perform an assessment on the actual uh, AV fistula. If you don't know what an AV fistula is, it looks like this. They really took the vein and the artery, artery, vein, AV. They sew them together. And this gives me as a nurse a bigger place um, to kind of go in and access that site because how often do you do dialysis? Look right here, y'all. It's, it's out, oh, where is it at? Hours a day, right? Um, I have it on here. It's like three or four hours a day, three or four days a week. And that is going to be your responsibility. So please go back and look at this. Make sure you palpate and you auscultate every time. What are you palpating for? You thrill. palpate for thrill. thrill. Yeah. Make sure you get it right because you palpate <laughs> for thrill. You auscultate for a bruit. Okay. Correct? Yes. I, I like to think of it that way. I, I palpate for a thrill. Y'all, you know when you touch something that's thrilling, you're like, oh, that's so thrilling. I, that's how I think about it. I don't know. If you touch your kid for the first time, you hug them. It's such a thrill. Yeah. Palpate, feeling, it's very thrilling. That's what I think about. I've seen that before. Auscultate every four hours. That's your job. Make sure you know certain things. There, are, there You got to know a few things a nurse ought to know. Um, make sure you go back and think about this as well. When you think about hemodialysis and nursing care, the time required to complete hemodialysis is four hours. It is long. Your patients need to know how long they're going to be there um, so you can kind of teach them. Daring, there's not much we do daring, I promise you. We make sure that it works and we send them on their way. Post-dialysis is where we're more concerned because we have to monitor them and see what's going on. We know that some of the common problems include hypotension, headache, uh, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, muscle cramps. Those are important for you to know because those are signs and symptoms. I would know those. Why not? Because what do I do? Dairy dialysis, nothing. But when the patient comes back, I need to monitor for these things so I can call the doctor and let them know why. What is going on with the patient? Is there a buildup of this, that, or the other? Things like that. Um, and then make sure you get their, their vital signs. We expect them to be hypotension, right? They, they might be hypotensive because they just got dialysis. So it may be necessary to rehydrate and start fluid volume and kind of do that stuff again. And then check for sepsis and fevers and things like that. Um, make sure you know that the patient's temperature may also be elevated because the dialysizing machine warms the blood slightly. So they, it's expected that you're gonna come back with a slight fever, but you're not gonna come back with a 101.5 fever. You come back with 99, no big deal. Y'all have had those kind of test questions before. Understand it's okay to have an increased body temperature because the, the, the fluid being put back in your body is increased. Makes sense. So also the heparin, right? The, the citrate required during the, the uh, uh, hemodialysis puts you at risk for bleeding. It's not uncommon that when you come back from uh, dialysis that you might have bleeding places. Invasive procedures, they need to be postponed for four to six hours because there is heparin in that dialysate to keep the, the blood from clotting, right? Those are little things that nurses must know in order to do their jobs effectively. Go back here, critical rescue. Think about a patient. Think about the heat transfer from the warm dialysis solution into the vasodilation and the drop in your blood pressure. That's why you come back with blood pressure so low. Kind of crazy. 
because of the vasodilation. When that occurs, what do you do? Reduce the temperature, right? Make sure that you respond to the modest declines in their blood pressure, adjust the rate of dialysizing, uh, put them in a Trendelenburg position because if we raise the head, the legs of the bed, it puts the fluid back to the core. These are things that matter to nurses because it matters to the patient. Everything else really doesn't matter. I know that's hard for me to say out loud. I'm, you're like, oh my God, you said that. I did. <laughs> so what's the difference between that and peritoneal? Peritoneal, like I said, you're going to put it into the, there's going to be a, like a catheter that exists that takes the fluid and puts it into your peritoneum. That's it. And it starts to come out. How does it work? Go back and read it all up if you'd like to. It talks all about how, how, how it works. But there are three phases I want you to be aware of. That's why I have it here. You have the fill, you have the dwell, and you have the drain. Go back and look and see what those look like. Your book talks about what it means to the, 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 the filling phase and the dwelling phase, and then what happens when it drains, because you have responsibilities in each one of those. And it's, it's listed right here. I have to fill you up with one to two liters of dialysate, meaning it goes inside your belly. And it takes about... 10 to 20 minute period and get in there and it stays all night while you sleep. And in the morning you drain it. So it fills, you dwell, and then you drain. Make sure you know what you're looking for at each one of those. Make sure you go back and understand right here where I highlighted all of this. It has to be sterile. The patient usually requires two liters of dialysate at 30 to 60 minute intervals, allowing for 15 to 20 minutes of drain. They keep doing this 30 to 40 times a night, they just keep putting more and more in. Two liters, at three times a week, that's what they do, it sucks. They just keep putting the dialysate in oh. and keep draining out. It's not a one-time thing. 30, 40 exchanges over and over, 15 to 20 minutes for 30 to 40 times. That's seven to eight hours. That's your entire night. So that's why it's important that we do a weight pre and we do a weight post that we measure fluid going in and we measure fluid going out. We're talking about large amounts of fluid. It's not a one-time bag is in and out. That's what I mean when it says, go back and look at stuff. Um, make sure you look at peritonitis. It's very possible that if I'm putting fluid into your belly, it might cause inflammation and it comes out of infection. It's the most common problem with uh, 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 peritoneal dialysis. That's why it's important that we maintain sterility, right? Um, yeah. Make sure that you understand that when your patient goes in there, pain is going to happen sometimes. Pain during the inflow of the dialysis is common. It usually lasts for you know a couple of weeks to two. It depends on what we're, what we're talking about. Um, cold dialysate makes it even worse. So you, you want to warm it up, but you never put it in the microwave. It says so here in your book. I've seen this as a test question like Inclex or ATI somewhere. Microwaves are not recommended for warming dialysate because you would burn the crap out of somebody's intestines. Like I mean, they're, they're, they're peritoneum. These are the things you have to focus on as a nurse. Go back and look at the patient safety things. Uh, mask yourself and your patient. Wash your hands. Put on sterile gloves. Remove the old dressing. Remove contaminated gloves. Then put on new stuff. Infection will get your patient screwed up. Um, empty the bladder before you start. And empty the bladder at, you know, empty, empty the bladder before you do it. Make sure you take a temperature pre and post so you can see how much it went up. Um, if, the, if the affluent, the fluid coming out, it shouldn't be brown. If it's brown, it's probably a bowel uh, preparation. It should, it, you know, it talks about right here, monitor the patient and recognize indications of peritonitis. If it's cloudy, if there's a fever, if there's tenderness, abdominal pain, if they're tired, nausea, vomiting, these could be a sign of symptoms of infection. If they have cloudy, opaque, uh, opaque fluid uh, drainage, peritonitis. Make sure you know what you're looking for. Your test can ask you anything, literally. So I'm going to stop on that right there. I, I think that was a good hour um, of our time. And I hope it was something that benefited you and helped you understand. You're probably going to get about less than 10 questions on that on your exam anyway. All that reading, about 10 questions. You know how I know this? Your syllabus told me. I just looked at it. 30 to 35 questions come from cardiac. So I would do a lot of cardiac reading if you have any problems. All right. Any questions? Yes. When are you doing cardiac? I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's a great question. I'll do some EKG interpretations um, this week, um, tomorrow at five o'clock my time. I'm also going to do one probably this weekend so I can get other people from Louisville who have, and other classes who have night classes. I'm trying to do days and nights to, to meet your needs. Y'all are the people I'm trying to serve. If you, don't, if you go on my calendar and you can't find a, a schedule for me, let me know. Do you know how to schedule individual appointments for me? 
Do you share your screen? I, I sure am. Let me, let me okay. go ahead and, and exit my full screen there. Let me pull this up for you guys so you can see exactly where to do all of this. And I'm just going to keep it recording so everybody can see it. Yeah. Who is on here? Oh, what am I doing? I got to go to I got to go to Galen's um, page first. That would be great. Okay, now let me go ahead and share my screen with y'all. Okay. I just want to get somewhere. That, I don't have grades to worry about anymore. So, all right. So if you go to your dashboard and you scroll down, it says Student Resource Center. You can click on this one. My says San Antonio. We also have this new one. I, I don't know if you're on the Louisville campus. Some might say that, or it might be this. Whatever you typically use to get to these enrichment folders. Mm -hmm. If you go in here, it says Live Enrichment Workshop. If you click on this one, it takes you to where we're at today, where you can look at every single thing that's being offered. So today is Monday, so tomorrow, Tuesday. Fluid and electrolytes, acid-based review. This is with uh, my, my counterpart, Nancy McConnell. She's in Louisville. Hit her up. At one o'clock, so noon tomorrow, you can watch her take on fluid and electrolytes and acid based review. It's the same crap. Um, you can keep going down and looking what matters to me. She's doing it again here. Um, if you look at tomorrow, I have, where did mine go for tomorrow? Did I screw it up already? <laughs> really? I keep trying to find mine. Mine don't show up. For, they, they are, but they're not here. Where are they? You don't see my name anywhere, do you? No. So I'm, I'm gonna go back and look. Let's go back since we're here looking. Anyway, I, you know, I'm the same as you. I don't always get things right either. <laughs> it's just the way it works. So let me go back and, and look over here on, on the main one. Maybe I put it in there. I don't know where I put it, to be honest with you. I'll go back and look though, because it should be in the same one regardless. Let's see if my name shows up here. It does not. So I'll go back and figure out why. Um, like I said, I, I plan on having more. Mine. Oh, and it comes up on my end, uh, Mrs. Shrim. Oh, well, I don't know why mine aren't showing up. Who knows? It says 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, EKG interpretation. So it'll be at 5, right? That's right. It'll be at 5 o'clock um, uh, Central Time. That is correct. So this is where you would find, but you can literally click on anybody's for anybody. I mean, if, if you're having a struggle with doses calculation, just do one. If you're struggling. Is that 5 tomorrow? I'm sorry, I cut you off. Is that 5 tomorrow? Um, you yes, you'd have to go go here like I showed you and you go on this thing and you can find you just click on it. So let's just say you want to go to Nancy's tomorrow at one o'clock. It'll give you her Zoom information. You can click that and it'll take you right there at that time. You can add it to your calendar. You can you know whatever you need to do, um, and that way you can find that. So that's one thing I wanted to show you. The last thing I want to show you on this though, which is really cool as well. Oops, it's not what I want to do. So it is what I want to do. Let's go back here one more time. All right, so when you, when you go here, if you're, if you're looking, it says team member and contact information. If you click on this, it lists every single one of the enrichment content specialists that we have for Galen College of Nursing, and it lists where we focus our attention at. So if you, if you notice here, I have 265. I do the BSN. Uh, she does, and I do. We, we both do the certain things. So if you click on my name where it says Calendly, and you click on it, it takes you right here. And I have all of these available times where you can book in at any one of these times and I can meet with you individually to discuss anything you want to discuss about anything related to 265. Nice. You can do that Thank as you. many times a day or a week as you want. And I'm here. This is what I get paid to do, y'all. So <laughs> share it with your friends. Let them know. Like if you're struggling with a concept, what I'm not going to do is reteach what you've already learned. But I will say, hey, this is where I would focus. This is what I suggest you do. Things like that. All right. I'm going to stop recording.